Father, our prayer as a family is that, again, you would take these words of mine and whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is good, whatever, whatever is profitable, that you would touch and that it wouldn't just be words that go in our heads, but words that go down to our heart. And so we pray that we would hear whatever you have for us, that we might become more like Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. So I got bad news and good news for you today. Bad news is this is a very hard teaching. In Hebrews, it said, the writer said to the Hebrews, I wanted to teach you and feed you meat, but I could only give you milk because milk is all you could take in. Today, I'm going to bring you some meat. So that's the bad news. The good news is because I'm bringing you meat, I'm going to keep it a lot shorter than I ever have, okay? <laughs> kind of a bittersweet moment. But we've been going through marriage. Last week we looked at it. We're going to look at it again today, and then we're going to look at it in a couple of weeks. It's kind of part two of a three-part series on marriage. When I come to Scripture, often it, it, it's not that radical to me. But when I come to passages related to marriage, I discover that the kingdom of God and what God intended marriage to be is radically different from our culture. And as your pastor, a one of your pastors, my fear is the reason that half of Christian marriages are ending in divorce is because they're not Christian marriages. They're American marriages. They've been built on an American culture. We, we fall in love, kind of the same way we fall into a pit. You know, we just fall in love. And if you look at our terminology, we fall in love because we have these amazing feelings feelings and, and, and we are attracted to the other person and then we're, that we're looking for companionship and we want to be happy and that's our driving force. And when we come into, into marriages with that expectation, when, when the other person isn't nearly as attractive, uh, when the other person isn't nearly as much fun, when we don't have nearly as many feelings, then we tend to withdraw from that marriage as if there's something wrong in it, and there, and there isn't. So I'm going to give, give you the hard truth today. I'm going to give it to you several times so you hear it, and then we're going to have communion. But it's a hard truth, and that is this, that marriage is more about making us holy than making us happy. Okay, now put that up against the American culture. Put that up against your expectations. And I'm going to suggest to you in the scriptures today that we are brought into marriage not so much to become happy, but to become holy. And when you discover that marriage is to make us holy, then you'll begin to understand things about marriage that you will never understand if you think it's all about being happy. So I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to send you to two passages that you could easily miss. And I'm just going to identify something in this concept. Now let me be honest with you and tell you this. It's a new truth for me. When I, when I discovered that marriage isn't so much about me becoming happy, but me becoming holy, then I had to look back on my marriage and say, have I treated my marriage on that basis? And here's the truth, I haven't. Because I'm going to suggest to you men that your primary responsibility is to allow your wife to become all that God wants her to be in Jesus Christ. And wives, that your primary responsibility is to garner, nurture, reflect, everything in this marriage that would allow your husband to become more like Jesus. And if your primary job is to allow nurture, not in words, but in behavior, a quiet spirit, if, if our words to each other is to, is to long and desire that our spouse would become more like Jesus, then I guarantee you this, either your marriage will become better, which it will, or you'll become better even if your marriage isn't any better. 
That, that's the radicalness of this truth, that my responsibility, my primary responsibility to Karen is to set her apart, to make her holy, to help her to become all that Jesus wants her to be. And that Karen's responsibility to me is to help me to become holy, help me to become all that Jesus wants me to be. And if I'm helping her doing that, and she's helping me to do that, in all probability our marriage is going to be much better. So let me take you to two verses. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Two weeks we're going to look at verses 22 through 33, but today we're just going to look at a word. It says in verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he may sanctify her. That is to set her apart, to make her holy that our responsibility as men is to do the same thing for our wives that Christ did for the church, and that is to set them apart. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Put down in your notes verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Scripture comes along in this marriage concepts and calls us to this radical commitment. Here's how Tim Keller says it. Marriage requires a radical commitment to love our spouses as they are, comma, while longing for them to become what they are not yet, period. Every marriage moves either toward enhancing one another's glory or toward degrading each other. Let me read it again. Marriage requires a radical commitment to love our spouses as they are not as we want them to be, not as they should be, but as they are, while longing for them to become what they are not yet. Every marriage moves either toward enhancing one another's glory or toward degrading each other. Marriage is a man and a woman being Jesus to one another, living by God's grace, lives of mutual sacrifice. Marriage is a man and a woman being Jesus to one another, living by God's grace, lives of mutual sacrifice. Now that's radical. Leave this place. Go down to the bar in Central Point and try to sell that concept. It'll be a hard one to sell. And so Scripture comes along, and one of the reasons we come here is to somehow compare God's truth with the world's truth, and God comes along and says, here's what I want. I want you two to be so radically, radically committed to one another, so radically in love with one another, that you will do everything you can to embrace the person as they are while still desiring them to become all that Jesus wants them to be. If, if that was my desire and my marriage in my relationship with Jesus, I guarantee you, had that been my focus earlier, my wife would be much more like Jesus. And I would be much more like Jesus. But we get distracted. We got work, we got friends, we got hobbies, we got our own selfishness to contend with. And in the process, we take our eyes off this core truth, this simple truth, that my responsibility is to do all that I can in my behavior to nurture and and entice and salt and light so that Karen will want to know Jesus more than she does and that her desire and her behavior and her salt and her light is to cause me to want to be like Jesus. That is a radical, radical truth. Now here's another truth. The problem in your marriage isn't your marriage. It's you. It's easy in our marriages to kind of think, 
I got a problem in this marriage, or I got a problem with my wife, Karen, and if I could just fix my marriage or fix Karen, boy, we could be happy again. The scriptures come along and says to us that the problem isn't my marriage and the real problem isn't my spouse. The problem is me. And that this marriage that God has designed, this, this marriage that God wants me to have with Karen is to point out those things in my life that are not in conformity to him, that she can expo ex expose my flat side. That... that that, that all of a sudden now this problem isn't Karen and this problem isn't marriage. I got to stop and say, what is it? Why am I irritable? Why, why am I, what is it about my selfishness that is making this into a problem? What, what can I become? And marriage becomes the furnace by which God uses to clean out the dross in my life. We're all excited to come study the Bible to be different, right? We're all excited about the Holy Spirit making us different, right? And then God comes along and says, your marriage will make you different. That this institution that God created is a marriage not only of intimacy and companionship, it's an, it, it's an agent that God uses to sanctify me, to set me apart, to make me more like Jesus, because the very problems that I have are a reveal of me. And when I come to terms with me, it changes how I live. If a bridge is built and it develops cracks because trucks drive over it, it wasn't the trucks that made the cracks. It was the impurity in the structure of the bridge. It's not the marriage that's making the cracks in your marriage. The marriage is just revealing the cracks in you. That, that's, that's where he's driving us. That's what he's saying to us. Listen to this. The reason that marriage is so painful and yet wonderful is because it is a reflection of the gospel, which is painful and wonderful at once. The gospel is that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. When we come to the gospel, we discover that we're more sinful, more flawed than we ever dared believe because now we've been introduced to the truth. And man, I thought I was bad, but not this bad. And then it goes on to say, and at the very same time, we are more loved and more accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That's the gospel. I'm more broken, more flawed, more sinful than I ever dared believe, but I'm more loved and more accepted than I ever dared hope. This is the only kind of relationship that will really transform us. So what's the problem in my marriage and your marriage? I'll give it to you in one word. Self. For the most part, you sit back away from the conflict, and you'll discover for the most part that most of our conflict in our marriages is that I want to be in the center of it and I don't want Christ to be in the center of it. That, that what is creating this conflict is selfishness. At its core, nine times out of ten times, it's selfishness. Which is why I'm going to take you to Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1, listen. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, in affliction, affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if you want to know what's creating most of the conflict in your life, I'm going to suggest to you that most of the conflict in your marriage is a result of your selfishness. 
And so now my responsibility to deal with my selfishness is to become more like Jesus because the more I become like Jesus, the less, less selfish I become. The best thing I can do for my wife is not religion. The best thing I can do for my wife is to become like Jesus. And when I become like Jesus, I become less selfish. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, because I'm going to give you two things that are almost as an introduction to what we'll cover next week. Because if you get these, you get it all. If you miss this, you get, miss it all. Ephesians 5, 17. Now, this is before the counsel that he gives us on marriage. We'll look at that in a couple weeks. Here's his introduction to marriage. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay, you want to know what the will of the Lord is? He's going to give it to you. And do not get drunk with wine, for this is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. We're going to cover the Holy Spirit uh, in January, but let me suggest to you right here, you want to know what God's will for you is, is that you be filled with with the Spirit. Now let me give you my understanding of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not getting more of the Holy Spirit, as if I only have 20% of them and I need to get another 80% because my problem is that I don't have all of him, and if I just had all of him, I'd be a much better person. Paul's counsel is that the filling of the Holy Spirit is not getting more of the Holy Spirit, it's giving me to more, more of me to the Holy Spirit. It, it's the imagery to fill a house is the idea that every room in that house has the Holy Spirit in it. Every area of your life has the Holy Spirit in it. And when you departmentalize your life, when you make it about church, or you make it about the Bible, or you make it about, when you, when you make it into small rooms and exclude him from all the other rooms, he's not a part of sports, he's not a part of work, He's not a part of your hobby. He's not a part of you compartmentalize. You squeeze him into a small room. Then you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. But when you open up every area of your life, every room, your marriage, your children, your friends, your work, your money, your time, your talent, when you open all those rooms, you become filled with his Spirit. And his Spirit begins to influence things that you have grieved or quenched him from. That, that's... That's the imagery there. So what is, so let's go on. But be filled with the Spirit. Now look what the result of the Spirit is. The result of being filled is not speaking in tongues. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that. It's not miracles. We'll cover that. It's not wonders. We'll cover that. Okay, it's not all those things that we want it to be. Here's what it is. Be filled with the Spirit, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. A joy heart comes. Verse 20, and always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a result that in my life, in my marriage, if I'm filled with the Spirit, then I will give thanks for the difficulties in my marriage. I will embrace them. I'll, th I'll say, dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you. It's hard to get it out, right? <laughs> thank you that in this conflict you are revealing the selfish parts of my life. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing this woman or this man into my life so that I could confront something in my life that I have to deal with. Dear Jesus, thank you for this broken marriage that is an opportunity that I can reveal your life in. Dear Jesus, thank you. That's the result of being filled with the Spirit. That I, that I take on a thankfulness, not bitterness. I, I, I influence that marriage with a thankful, joyous, singing, radiant heart. And then he, then he goes on in verse 21. What else is the result of being filled with the Spirit? 
Not only is, is my speech different, not only am I thankful, but I am to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. I, I find it easier to subject myself to my wife and serve her even though I don't think she's serving me. Even though I'm giving more than she's giving. We keep score. I keep score. Forgive me. I don't blame anybody else. I look at what I do in a given day, and I look at what she's doing in a given day, and when my list is bigger than her list, I start getting angry. And all of a sudden, the scorecard that I'm carrying around, trying to figure out what she did today compared to what I did today, and not placing myself in a relationship where I say, I want to serve you, because I'm to model Jesus in my marriage. Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality a thing to be grasped, but it being himself and became a man. And not just a man, became a servant. And not just a servant, died on the cross. So what is it for me if I become what Jesus wants me to be and subject myself that I have to be at some point willing to die to my selfishness and throw away the scorecard and begin to love her 1 Corinthians 13, love her, so that she can become like him. Listen to this. Jesus did not leave us on our own, but provided the Holy Spirit as a power to fight against and overcome sin. The Holy Spirit's task is to unfold the meaning of Jesus' person and work to believers in such a way that the glory of it, its infinite importance and beauty, is brought home to the mind and the heart. And when it is brought home to the mind and the heart, it works itself out in marriage. This counters the self-centeredness that is intrinsic to our sinful nature. To have a marriage that sings, Ephesians, requires the spirit created the, the ability to serve and to take yourself out of your own. The spirit's work of making the gospel real to the heart weakens the self-centeredness of the soul and the deep happiness and the deep happiness and the deep happiness that a marriage can bring lies on the far side of sacrificial service in the spirit and power of God. So here's the biblical view of marriage. That I don't enter and expect happiness to be on this side. The biblical view of marriage is that I am to come into this marriage as a servant to do whatever I can do that my spouse can know Jesus better. And as a result of becoming a servant, allowing them to become better, then out of that comes all of the happiness that I had hoped for. But it's on this side of my desire that my spouse become like Jesus, not on that side. I don't look for my happiness so that your job is to become like Jesus, and if you were only more like Jesus, we'd be a lot happier here. I start by being a servant and having served and helping my spouse become all that God wants them to be, the result of that at some point, and, and this is what I love about Keller, at the far end of this, not just here, <laughs> happiness may come here. That's why God calls us not to happiness in marriage, but to holiness in marriage. And when you begin to do that, it begins to transform your life. It begins to shape how you see your marriage and how you see your spouse and what your responsibility is. And my job is to become the incarnated Christ in this marriage so that in my behavior, they'll come to know him. We're tired of words. I'm tired of words. I'm tired of people saying, praise God. I want their lives to praise God. I want them to live God. I want me to live God. My, my wife, she listens to me all week. She doesn't need one more word from me. But she needs within me a life filled with the worthiness that is 
do her if I would respect and honor her as I should. So if you want to become somebody who allows your spouse to become all that God wants them to be, then you will become a person who is filled with his spirit. But let me give you a second thing that you'll have to do. And that is you'll have to allow the Holy Scriptures to transform you. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That it is the Scriptures that will transform you. That's why I teach. I, there, listen, I've traveled this world being a motiva motivational speaker. I can stay away from the hard truths and make people laugh all day long. That's not going to make your marriage better. What's going to make your marriage better and what's making and needs to make my marriage better is that I find myself obedient to the Holy Scriptures no matter what they call me to, even when it's hard. And deciding that marriage is about me becoming holier and helping my spouse to become holier rather than me being happy and them being happy and happiness is going to be a result of the holiness, that's a hard truth. But, it, but, it's a, but, but it's a core truth. Every Christmas, I have spouses come to me and say, I want to get my spouse a Bible. What, what, what translation should I get them? And I say to them every year, and I'll say it to you this year, the translation of the Bible they need is your life in that home. Forget the Bible the new Bible with the leather and the new translation. You be the Bible. You incarnate the Bible. You live the Bible. You be transformed by the Bible. And I guarantee you that will make your marriage much greater. And that's the gift that they will want much higher than a new leather Bible that sits on a shelf six days a week. But here's the other thing we have to understand about Scripture. <laughs> It's such a hard truth. Scripture is by its very nature telling us to do stuff that doesn't come naturally. It's the hard stuff. Scripture doesn't tell us to eat pizza. <laughs> Eating pizza is easy. Scripture doesn't command you to go watch a football game this afternoon. Watching a football game when it's raining outside is going to be real easy for me to do this afternoon doesn't need to tell me to go watch a football game. What Scripture tends to call us to is that which is not simple, but that which is hard, and that which is counterintuitive to our very nature, because my neighbor nature screams out, be selfish. And Scripture comes along and over and over again begins to show all of the ways that I am selfish, and it wants to correct my behavior. And so in a marriage that I want to be happy in, Scripture calls me to be holy in. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're single, you say, well, what, what did all this have to do with me, Bill? Here's what it had to do. Here's what it has to do with you. You're called to be a, sanct a, a sanctifying agent in all of your relationships. Set apart Christ as Lord of your life and be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you. Your job, our job outside of our marriage is to set apart Christ, to become holy so that those who see our hope in the midst of our suffering would be drawn to him. And so your calling is the same as my calling, that is to the people around you, help them to become all that God wants them to be so that the unbelieving husband or the unbelieving wife can, can be sanctified by your life or the unbelieving friend can be sanctified by your life. So you sit there and go, okay, well, I, I, man, you Bill, you got me. Okay, so I got to say, I got to, I got to, marriage is not about happiness, it's about holiness, and my job is to make my spouse all that God wants them to be, and that becomes my focus and my attentiveness, and it's about the Savior and not the self, and I'm going to help them. And I, I, my first prayer in the morning may need to be, what, what can I do, Jesus, to make Karen love you more? today. And my prayer might be to, to be at the end of the day, dear Jesus, did I make my wife love you more because I loved you more and I loved her more? It may be as simple as praying for your spouse. 
Second thing it may be is that you just simply live Jesus at home. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 3, he tells us to live quiet lives, that our behavior would reflect that. That I am to be Jesus in my home, to my wife, or you to your husband, that, that just be Jesus. Don't, you don't even have to talk about him, just be him. Thirdly, be thankful. Thank God for the marriage that's painful to you. Thank God for where you're at. If it's great, thank him for the greatness. If it's lousy, thank him for the lousiness. Because in the lousiness, he's making you more like himself. Go around your house not bitter, not angry, not upset. Go around your home thankful and see what it does to your marriage. And then definitely... If you want to be a sanctifying agent in your spouse's relationship with God, be filled with his Holy Spirit because it's his Holy Spirit that will make you less selfish. So the teachings come down to two things. Number one, I believe that if you set your spouse and say, my desire is that they would know you, Jesus, that they could become all that you want them to be and that I can literally be an instrument in your hands to make them more like you, I give you that. I'm going to say to you, it will make your marriage better if, forget the tips and techniques, just desire that they would become all that they need to be in Jesus. But if it doesn't make your marriage any better, here's the other promise I'll make to you. It'll make you better. It'll make you a better person. And whether this marriage gets any better or not is, is, is somewhat immaterial to the fact that you will become better when your desire is to live a life that is allowing and transforming to the people around you. And so I say to you in the core of this teaching that marriage is not about finding happiness. It's about finding holiness. And if you seek holiness you will find on the far end, I believe, a happiness that you would have never found had you not pursued the holiness. And I told you this would be a hard teaching. So we're going to take communion. Here's what I want you to do when you hold the elements before we take them all together. Here's the beauty. Jesus modeled this. Jesus, follow this, because this is what communion is about. Jesus came to earth. He incarnated into our lives, came into our lives so that we could become holy and set apart, so that we could know God. Jesus comes into our lives so we could know him, and communion represents and models that, and I would say to you this morning, calls you to that same thing, that you are to sacrifice your life. You are to die to you so that those around you could come to know him as we came to know him through Jesus. When you have the elements in your hand, reflect on that, that he modeled these very words in his life. Let's have communion together.